So I became a Christian when I was 16, um, after having watched a pirate version of the film Passion of the Christ. Um, I'd watched that on an illegal DVD that I bought from a pub that I was drinking a pint of Stella with my brother. Um, and I took it home and watched it and felt, oh, I felt so intrigued as to finding out who this Jesus was. And so I then spoke to the one Christian I knew at school, who was someone I teased for being a Christian for a little while, and said, can I come with you to church? And she thought I was pulling a leg or trying to date her. I mean, eventually I did and married her. But um, I said, um, it's the long game, isn't it? Uh, but I said, um, take me to church. And I went to church. And very quickly, the pastor took me under his wing. And so my, um, my discipleship curve was very intense very quickly. So from like a, few, a couple months in, I was being asked to give a thought at like a Bible study. And then a few months later, I was being asked to share a little bit in a Sunday service. And then a few months after that, can I give a whole talk? And then a few months after that, can you come with me on a speaking thing and, and do a little thing before I give it? And there was all that I was given loads and loads of opportunity very early on, probably far quicker um, than my lifestyle was necessarily reflecting. I think uh, this guy was taking loads of risks on me as a young teenager and where my lifestyle was trying to catch up with the revelation of God, um, this guy was just pouring in loads of opportunities for me to preach. Um, and so, but because I didn't grow up going to church, I've always been very passionate about how we communicate the gospel, especially to people who haven't grown up going to church. Um, and so one of the, the things that I always think about when I'm preaching is how do we make the... Um, how to make the foreign seem familiar and the familiar seem foreign. So what I'm talking about, like if you've grown up going to church, how do you make the familiar stories that you've grown up listening to, feeding the 5,000, uh, raising of Lazarus, all those stuff that you've done fuzzy felt or whatever you do in kids' work. I never went to kids' work. I never went to church. But all that stuff, how do you make those familiar stories seem foreign so that you're like, oh, wow, I had no idea that that's what actually was going on. I had no idea that that links this Old Testament prophecy. I have no idea that that's what it would like sound like to someone who's in that context. I have no idea. I love doing that stuff. But also to those who is, it's their first time in church, how do you make the foreign seem super familiar? That actually, you know, Jesus wept because we also weep and we also feel emotion. And, and oh yeah, okay, well I know what mourning feels like. Oh, so does God. Like suddenly that thing feels familiar and it's not about the subject thing. So I've been super passionate about that. Um, for years and so I was a youth pastor for uh, eight years and speaking up and down the country mainly to youth groups um, all over the place and then um, when I got uh, when I entered theological college for the second time to train to be a vicar the preaching got really boring very quickly like at, at theological college and and that's not because of the theological college I went to the theological college I went to it was a great one do you know what I mean but it just felt that the content around preaching was so staid and so um boring and I was like what's going on here what's happening here what, what what's being lost it felt like the people teaching us how to speak weren't passionate about the thing they were asking us to do or or the or the the the, the, the some of the first love had had died out and so I was like after I got ordained I was like I'd never want to lose that I never want to lose that zeal for the for the word I never want to lose the passion for the Bible I never want to lose the pursuit of Jesus when we're communicating the gospel and a passage that I come back to regularly is 1 Thessalonians 1 4 to 5 it says this for we know brothers and sisters loved by God that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words but also with power with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction you know how he lived among you for your sake. So there are components to this thing. We've been chosen. Been chosen, but our gospel came to us not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. And also our lives tell that story too. For know, for know how we lived among you for your sake. And I feel that that passage just wraps up everything we're trying to do when we preach. We want to preach with words, of course we do. We want, to pre we want to make sure that the words that we write are sensible and they are coming across coherently and they're well planned and well prepped. But also we're preaching so that God may meet his people in power and hopefully we're being filled with the spirit. Hopefully we have deep conviction as we communicate these things and hopefully our lives are reflecting the thing that we're preaching. But the challenge is... If you're going to preach regularly, how are you going to do that all the time? 
character. I mean, how can you be as passionate about the, the verse in Leviticus as you are as passionate about the, the verse in Acts as you're preaching that? And how are you going to keep all that going? I mean, it's, and that's why we're on a marathon, right? Not a sprint. And what God is calling us to is a lifestyle of discipleship, not of just impressive moments. He's in it for the long haul of the, of the keep walking, keep moving one foot in front of the other and let's work this life out together. And as you preach, as you lead and whatever you do, I'm continually teaching you, continually learning. And so my desire is that whenever we lead in whatever space, whether it's we're leading services or we're preaching, is that we'll never stop being learners. We'll never stop be people asking the question why and how and what and how can I get better and what am I doing that's a bit weird and I ask my wife the question all the time and then I regret it the minute she starts answering it. I'm like, oh, why have I asked that question again? But I want to learn. I want to learn what are the weird ticks that I say? What are the phrases that I keep on saying just because it's a comfort filler instead of saying um and 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 all that? Like, tell me those things. The reason we've got a camera up there is not because we're broadcasting to millions of people. It's so that we watch back our sermons and we're like, oh, oh why do I do that weird thing in my leg? I stand behind the lectern because I'm nervous about what I'm preaching, so it's a comfort blanket. I often do this when I'm preaching about something quite nervy. Like if I'm like, ah, oh, I'm about to like say something that's like a pastory thing to say and I get nervy, so I put one foot here and I start doing that. And I'm like, guys, it's not really me, it's the Bible, you know. Um, anyway. So I want to give us some practical things around preaching. Um, and I, I alluded it to it at the beginning, but someone said this past two days, we were at a conference, and they talked about this cycle of comparison, copy, and compete. And I'm sure we've all got those kind of things in our lives at some point where um, we start comparing ourselves to someone else. And in this world of Instagram and YouTube and all that stuff, it's very easy to, if we're asked to preach on Matthew 5, then suddenly we go onto YouTube best preachers in the world who have preached on Matthew 5 and then we watch them and we're like oh, I'm never going to be that good so what we then do is because we're comparing ourselves with them we then start copying their thing we see that amazing illustration that involved four, 45 ladders and so we're like how do I get 45 ladders by Sunday and then we and we copy that stuff right but then what happens is then what we start to do is compete so we start to think well that guy when he preached that thing Loads of people came forward for ministry, like untold amounts, or loads of people put their hands up to give their lives to Jesus. And now, but, but when I preach, one person kind of might have given their life to Jesus, maybe. And so we start to compete, and we have these weird metrics in our head of what does the success look like. And so we get stuck in that cycle. Instead of what we should be doing, is we should be cultivating. We should be, and cultivating literally means like tilling the soil, like like really going to work with what we've been asked to do, really like putting in the effort, cultivating something so that actually what we do is we start creating something. Now, of, of course, not every sermon is going to be 100% unique because ultimately Jesus preached the best sermons and we're just riffing off his. And Paul preached the second best sermons and we're kind of riffing off his. But, but where is the creation going on? Because then what, what then happens is instead of competing, we're able to contribute something into the life of the church. Does that make sense? Um, and I want to remind you that God has called you to communicate his good news through your story. That's ultimately what preaching is. God has called you to communicate his good news, but through your story. And so he hasn't called someone who's not here. I mean, he has called a lot of people. This isn't the only, like, do you know what I mean? But he hasn't, like, he's called you because of what you bring and the story he's brought you through. And so we shouldn't shy away from that. But what so many preachers do is they think God has called me, but only the good parts of me, only the really like positive attributes of me. No, he's also called you by in your weakness. Because Paul, Paul says, I'm the chief of sinners. Do you know what I mean? If you think you sin, I'm even better at sinning than you are. That's what Paul is saying. And he says, it's my weakness that his strength is made perfect. Not when I preach all the great sermon illustrations where I'm really good, you know what I mean? The, the four times we prayed for someone and they might have, like, their headache might have subsided. There are healing stories, you know? Why don't you tell people when you failed to pray for people, when there was a failure? Because it's in, his, in our weaknesses that God's glory is made manifest when we preach. Um, so God has called you to communicate his good news through his story with you. So a couple of things that when I sit down with someone and it's their first time preaching, I want to ask one question to start with, and it's what is the goal? What's the end dream of this? Is our, sorry, I keep pointing to this whiteboard. I won't. Um, what is the end goal of your preach? Is it um, that people get a, get a hunger or a passion for God's word? Is it that after you preach, people come and they're ministered to in the presence and power of God? Is it that people have an opportunity to give their life to the Lord? 
Is it that you inspire within your congregation people to serve more, to give more, to pray more? What is the thing that you're trying to do on that any given Sunday? Because that will determine everything else about the delivery, about the intention, about the direction, about where you put the GPS. Like what is the destination of the talk that you're giving? Because if you want people to be passionate about the word, um, because that's what you feel is, is coming through in the text that you've been asked to preach, it's going to be very different to if you want everyone to sign up and join a team because you're trying to mobilize people to do something different. So we have to determine the goal at the beginning. And that will only come through everything else that everyone has said today, through like rigorous study of the scripture, through um, getting to know people, getting to know the church. But ultimately, when you've got a blank page, and you're like, where do I go from here? Ask the Lord, what's the one thing you want to do with the congregation today? Where's the one thing? Where are we taking them? What's the one place? And now then you will approach that in many different ways. I'm not saying you just have to have one point, because I'm a big fan of those talks. But um, where, where, what is the destination that we need to be? In 20 minutes, where do we need to be, Lord? Is it that everyone needs to receive a word from the Lord? Cool. The way the sermon is going to be preached will be very different to are we all going to leave the, leave the um, church and go and love our neighbors in all the kinds of different ways. You get the point. Um, and so the thing is, is that often what that does is if you're given a text to preach on and you determine a goal, a single goal, it means that suddenly you have a lot of editing that you're able to do and exercise. Because ultimately, if you're going to be in this for the long haul, which hopefully most of you are, um, I mean, I haven't heard you preaching, maybe not, um, but if, like, hopefully you'll, you'll be inspired to preach lots. And it might be that you're asked to preach this text again in four or five years' time or ten years' time. You don't have to preach everything you know about the text on that one Sunday. And it's such temptation, isn't it, to preach in the room, that we, get, we hit the commentaries, we get all our notes in, and we like, we, I need to tell everyone about the revelation that God has given me today in every way. So I'm going to tell you every Greek and Hebrew word. I'm going to tell you every sermon illustration. And you're trying to like be like a fire hydrant and be like, bah, I know so much, which is really the shadow side of what's actually going on. Because we all feel insecure as preachers, and we all want love, we all want appreciation, and so really what we really want people to do is pat us on the back and say, well done, you're very clever, thank you. And what how defining a goal does is it, it, gives us, um, it gives us editing, we know what to edit towards. Because if we don't have a goal, we don't know what to edit, we don't know what to take away, and we're just like, wicked, I've hit my word count, it's ready to go, let's go. So determine your goal, what's the main thing? Um, and, then, and then ask yourself some questions. What do people need to know? Like, what do they need to know? What, what, not what could they know, but ultimately, what do they need to know? You've only got 20, 25, 35, 40, depending on what church you're in. Um, you've only got some time, or if you're the lead pastor, add 10 minutes, because you always get grace. Um, what do they need to know? But then ask the question, why do they need to know it? Like, why do they need to know this thing? Because all this stuff will start to enter in, like the content of your talk. And, and this is really important. What's at stake if they don't? And this will drive the passion point that um, Rebu was talking about. If you're lacking in passion about what you've been asked to preach, which happens sometimes for the best of us, finding out what's at stake if people do not know what you're telling them will drive passion. Because ultimately, if, 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 you, work, if you do the hard work of working out what's li literally at stake. So if you're preaching on sharing the good news, what's literally at stake is your best mate might never know the gospel of Jesus Christ, therefore they might never go to heaven if, if, if people don't get hold of this. There's quite a lot at stake there, isn't there? So suddenly you're starting to preach with a bit more passion because you want your best mate who doesn't know Jesus to, to be in eternity with you, right? I mean, I do. Um, so what's at stake? What's at stake if our church is super unfriendly? And so in this sermon about hospitality or serving or whatever, what's at stake if our church is unfriendly? Well, we've got a lifespan. You know, ultimately no one wants to stick around a friendly church. So ultimately, people will leave. So if you know what's at stake, if people don't hear, then it will drive the passion. It will start to help you edit a bit more. And then ultimately, what do people then need to do? And this is the call to action thing that Mike was talking about. What do people need to do at the end of your talk? What's the, what's the call to action? Now, is it come forward for prayer and be uh, prostrate before the Lord and repent? If, if that's where, then that's going to drive. Is it they need to scan a QR code and join a, I don't know, whatever it is, food banks or whatever? What, is the, what do they need to do? What's the, and I'd say, like, try and be specific and creative. 
Be specific in it. Make sure that you're not like, here's 75 ways to respond because we all do it as preachers because we all need love and we all need to make sure that our sermons hit home. And so therefore we give 15 ways you could respond to our talk. So when someone says, how was the talk gone? You're like, it's been great because 15 people responded to my talk. Like, let's be specific and creative. Let's work out ways that people can engage with our talks. But um, be specific about it. And then why do they need to do it? Why do they need to do it? What is... The, and this, this drives home a bit of the what's at stake, but why do they? Like, so what? <laughs> you know, why do I need to be uh, welcoming to people when they come to church? Me specifically. So driving that home. And then finally, how can I help them remember? And someone was saying earlier, you know, um, sometimes the most forgotten part of anything in life is the last thing. So if you think about a meal, when you're handed the bill at the end, if that's thrown at your face with a bill and like there's no just, oh, thanks, pay... Um, that will mar how you think about that meal, even if it's nothing to do with the food, right? We all know that. If someone, if you've gone for a, a meal at a friend's house and you've eaten the, you've you had the main course and you have the dessert, and then someone goes, right, cheers, guys, bye, I'm going to bed. That's going to change how you feel about the rest of the thing. And the, the end of your talk is so important because ultimately people's memory will be mainly around the ending of your talk. And yet so often some people get, come to the end of their content and think, oh, um, amen. And everyone just goes, amen. And then that's it. It's like, what? Like, where's the ending of it? And it also it comes to leading services, how we end a service. What are we saying? What are we saying at the end needs so much thought and attention. And then how do we greet and say goodbye to people at the end of a church service? It's massively going to be disproportionate as to how much people remember. So how do we end it? Um, so I'm going to use the whiteboard now. Just, I, I, I do this, the way we do it, if I've asked someone to preach, is what I will say to them is, we'll go for coffee, um, and all we'll do is we'll take our Bibles and notebook at that meeting, and we'll just open up the scripture that we've been asked to preach on, and I'll literally go through this uh, with everyone to give them a framework, a skeleton to think about how they're going to construct their talk, and I thought that might be helpful, is that alright? Cool. So if we've got a, uh, a passage... I don't know, I'm just going to open the Bible completely randomly. Um, let's go, I say randomly, I'm flicking past some, isn't it? I'm like, I'm not doing that one. That's not for today. Let's do Jesus changed water into wine, right? So we've got John 2. Okay. Okay, so the first thing I do when I sit down with someone is we read through the passage, John 2, on the third day a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me, Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 80 to 120 liters. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw them out and take it to the marsh of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheap wine after the guests have had too much to drink, but you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana and Galilee was the first of the signs through which he has revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and brothers and his disciples. There they stayed for a few days. I would never recommend reading the Bible like that in your Sundays. But um, so what we do is I sit and we have an empty page. And on one side, I say, let's write down what do we know. And on the other page, put what don't we know. Cool. And so we might go through it again and say, well, what do I know? Well, I know um, we've got Jesus and we've got the disciples there. They've been invited to a wedding. Um, and so we might, we might like, start having a think about wine and weddings. We know that's happening. Um, we know other things we might know is it's the first miracle um, what else do you guys know from the top of your heads about this story? I don't want Hebrew or Greek at this point, but what do you know just, just from like Sunday school? What's just some like basic things that you might know about this story? Shout something out. 
Yeah, so the wine has run out. Yeah. Anything else? He serves the best wine last. Yeah, great. Okay, so on one side of paper, I'll just write all the things that I know. And it might, it might be that you've preached a couple of times, and you might know, oh, there's some passages that link to this. And so you might scribble those down as well, things you do know. But then I think what's super interesting, and this, if you're a member of Penny Lane, this is where you know I get all of my like, good stuff, um, is the stuff I have no idea about. So you might go back through the passage, and you're like, well, why does he call his mum woman? It's weird, right? That's a weirdness. And we have to, if you've been at Penn Lane, we talk about this a lot, you have to stop at the weirdness in the Bible. It's not put there for, it's, it, it's, it is bizarre. So I might put uh, the phrase woman there. Okay, well, what else is weird? Um, I think it's weird that we're told how much detail about exactly what bottles, like numbers mean stuff in the Bible. So why are there six stone water jars and why are we told it's specifically 80 to 120 liters? Like there's too much detail right? Remember, this isn't, um, the Bible isn't like a newspaper report. There's detail put in there for a reason. So that might just lead me down a little rabbit hole. I might just do a bit of like investigation around that. Um, there's, uh, what else is weird or what else don't you know? I don't, I mean, I know nothing about, I mean, I do know a little bit, but um, I know nothing really about Jewish wedding ceremony. So I'm like, who is the master of ceremonies? Why is he brought into this? So that might, um, that might give me some, some Jewish wedding stuff. So already what we're doing, and this will be a, a month out from someone who's first preaching. But what we're doing already is we're saying we've got a bit of research that we need to do. Some things that we need to go and have a look at. And I guarantee you, if you have a look at the things you don't know about a passage, this stuff is also going to drive passion because you're going to uncover new things and you'll start to do that foreign, familiar, familiar foreign thing very quickly. You'll start to be like, well, we've read through this passage and we just thought everyone calls their mum woman from the Middle East. We're just, because we're racists and we read our Bibles through a Western mind view and we just think, oh, does everyone like call that? Of course they don't. No, not at all. And so what is Jesus doing here? So we start to unpack some, some stuff that helps the... Um, familiar seem foreign and the foreign seem familiar. So that's the first thing we do. The next thing I do is once you've got that page, is I flip it over. Cool. Um, and one of my Bible uh, lecturers at college used to have this phrase, it's like preaching is preaching the good news and therefore it should be good and it should be new. Um, and by good, what we don't mean is like positive and happy. We just mean like what is telling us of the goodness of God in, in this passage? So whatever it is, where, do, where can we already see the activity of God who is good in all he is, and, but also what is new to us? And there, there might be some overlap between those two pages, but you start to have a look at that stuff. Um, and you, you can do this in your own time. We don't need to go through it. But what is good as we go through it? Okay, so Jesus is, is clearly doing something in his provision here. It's clearly pointing towards something. There's a miracle happening. So there's all the good stuff. But then what is new, and you start to write down the stuff that is new to you. So do that a month out. And that's just to get, like, the juices flowing a little bit and to get people thinking and reading a bit in advance. Um, I'll get into detail at some point, but... Um, <laughs> At Penny Lane, we plan our sermons a year in advance, so we, go, we have a meeting in May, and then we look at what we're going to preach through January through to December. There's some empty gaps in there for, you know, it might be a random one, and it might be that we're going to wait to see what the Lord's going to say and all that stuff, but, but ultimately we have the best part of 12 months of preaching in the diary, so it means I can ask preachers, so it means they can read up well in advance, partly because I've come from churches that didn't do that. And so they ask you to preach two weeks out, and you're like, ah! So all, the, only excuse, the only thing you can do is go onto YouTube and quickly go, who said what about this? I'm just going to quickly, like, Alexify that, and then give that. And I just don't want that to happen. So we try and be as, as prepped as possible, which is why we have, like, stuff a month out. Um, then the next thing I would do is after that, is when you're getting to writing the actual content, if you're, everyone struggles for structure, 
It's the one thing people are like, I just don't know what to do with structure. I've got my intro, I've got my outro, I don't really know what to do with the middle, all this stuff. I use this um, framework that Andy Stanley used, so you, excuse me if you've heard it before, but I find it super helpful just for clarity's sake. Um, and it's, it's this. So this would be the main structure of a talk. Me, we, God, you, we. Right. Um, and the idea for this is we start by saying, not stuff about me, that's not what, no one wants to hear about that, but, um, but what people do want to know is why are you passionate about the thing you're about to tell us about, right? Um, like, what has happened in your life that means the thing that you're about to tell us is worth taking note about, right? Um, So I, I think this is super important and sometimes under, I think people sometimes talk a lot about themselves, that's not what I'm saying. What I, what I think we all need to hear is why is the person who's communicating to us, why are they passionate about the thing, what has God said to them in the past, what, what has been the spark that's meant that actually I, I'm now going to give you my attention about the rest of the thing. One of the problems with politics is um, hardly anyone has suffered the things that they're also trying to give us policy for. Right? And so we listen to them talking about free school meals. I'm like, you haven't had a free school meal in your life. And so immediately we switch off about anything else, right? Um, when they might have really good things to say about other things. But because they don't locate what they're saying in their own lived experience, it means that we often, just as humans, switch off. So it's important to, and this, doesn't, this isn't like, I'm going to write 200 words here, 200 words here. Like, it's not all equal. It might just be a line. It might just be a, a thing that you start with that says something about why it's important to you. But then you quickly go on to this. Why is it important that we should all care about the thing we're communicating about? So it might be, I don't know, Jesus changing water into wine. Our one point might be that, um, let's have a go. We might do out of this a talk on generosity, that God is a God who brings out his best even when the world has, um, has, has thought they've, got, they've brought everything else. God is the God who brings us everything. And so we might talk about, we might start by saying, Do you know what? this is how generosity impacted me um, in a big way. This is, this is where something in my life where, uh, I, I mean, for me, for example, I ran away from home when I was 14. I then moved, I went to live with my mum, but then had to move out again when I was 17. And a, fa a Christian family took me in. And that display of generosity has marked me and my wife's life. Uh, forever, which means we always have a spare room in our house, which means we always have random people live with us, which means Christmases and Easter's and all that are, are just very different for our family because we just have anyone who's around come spend Christmas with us rather than us going to our families. So generosity has really impacted us. But then you might go here, well, why, why does that matter for everyone else? It's nice that you, Alex, have had this impact. Why, and then, so then, like, I love this stuff, but you might go something like, well, research suggests that we are the loneliest nation. You know, we have a minister for loneliness. And so we know that we are, if we're talking about generosity, we know that we are a church that believes that God sets the lonely into families. It's a display of a generosity family. And so we might then talk about that. And then God is, is not just the God part. We're not like, we're not doing the God slot at a youth club on Fridays. But at this point we're saying, okay, well, what does God say about this stuff, right? What does God, what is, what is the revelation from Jesus about this stuff? What is it that God says? And as I said, these aren't equal bits, right? So it might, this might be a line. This might be three minutes, but this might be like 20. Um, then the you is, and, and some people get uncomfortable about this, but as preachers, we have to um, provoke people. Um, we have to inspire them. We have to challenge them. And if, but we also have to be willing to be challenged first. But this is the part where you say, well, this is what you need to do about it. This is what you need to do about generosity ultimately ultimately generosity is something that we first receive from God and then we then give back to him that's what glory is right glory is we receive glory and then we just give it back to him that's the worship cycle is is God gives us his glory by his spirit and then we would return the glory back to him and that's worship and generosity is exactly the same in fact our whole discipleship is exactly the same we just receive what God has given us and we just give it back to him which means you can't keep stuff back like Ananias and Sapphira which means you can't keep anything back from him he owns it already and so we just give it back to him. And so that's what you need to do about it. And then the we is, how, is forecasting, well, what would church look like if we all did everything I've just said? 
right? And you're coming into land at this point. What would church look like? And this way you cast a vision of not just where the church is at, but imagine if a year down the line, if there was no lonely person in this church, how would that feel? How would your invitation to your best mate doesn't know Jesus, how, how much more would that give, give that fire? Because you know you can invite them on any Sunday and they're going to be invited to hang out that next week. You know that no one is lonely here. You know that people have a connection point. Um, so that's a, a, a forecast of what we would look like as a church if we all did that. Um, helpful so far? The we? The first one, how they're different. So this is like, why, why does it matter to us? Why should we take note? Why should we care? And that's where you might want to bring in some research. It might be that you might want to bring in a local story, something that you've experienced at the church. It might be something about why we should all take note in everything else. Does that make sense? Great. Um, the, um, one of the things I heard time and time again at Theological College is things like, oh, sermons are, are dying art, and we're moving beyond sermons, right? And we might have things like, well, if you're in a working class area, then people just don't, aren't going to listen because we're not wired like that. Um, I grew up on a council estate, so single home dad, uh, single parent uh, household, sorry. And, um, and I, I don't think that's the case because me and my family, every Friday night, we'd watch like some comedian on Saturday Night Takeaway or whatever it was or the National Lottery. And there'd be some stand-up comedian who would stand up with no visual aids at all and people would listen to him for, for an hour plus, right? People pay loads to see Peter Kay. And like, oh, I don't even know why. But um, they, wa they watch Peter Kay for like two hours telling a load of jokes. And, um, people, and there's no visual aids. He doesn't have four ladders that he's climbing up or any of that stuff. But why are they listening to him? And so I don't think the spoken word is dead at all. Joe Rogan podcast, three hours long. People listen to that. And they engage with it in whatever way. Me and um, our ops director went to see Stephen Bartlett, you know, Diary of a CEO. He was speaking in Liverpool recently. We went and spoke. He spoke for an hour, and then there was a little break of 10 minutes and spoke for another hour, and everyone was hooked the whole time. He spoke with no notes, and it was incredible. And I was like, the spoken word is not dead. I think what's dying is a passion for it in the church. I think what's dying is a, is a care and attentiveness towards it. And I think what's, um, what has breeded is like a kind of... Um, an over-familiarity with the opportunity to just preach. And so sometimes we just ask to preach and we just take the opportunity and just think, okay, well, I'll just put in my notes and then whatever. Um, but all, what all those people do, whether it's Joe Rogan or Stephen Bartlett, is they've definitely got their finger on the pulse. Some of them pay a lot of money to make sure they've got their finger on the pulse of, of what's actually going on in people's lives. Which means that when Stephen Bartlett puts up a video, um, whether it's a, a two-hour video with him and Simon Cowell, the like clickbaity thing has basically come from research saying what are people going to click on. And it might be just one line in the rest of the whole interview might not be about that one line, but they know what's going on. And so, you know, I think um, it was Steve or, or Mike who said it. Knowing people is going to like accelerate the effectiveness of your sermons uh, so rapidly, but we've got, got to make sure we're in the lives of people, which makes it hard as preachers because ultimately sometimes God asks us to preach on stuff that we know is going to drive at the heart of a pastoral situation that's been going on. And you know that to the left, you can see like a couple that you've been pastoring and their marriage is breaking up and you're talking about faith or whatever. You know, there's like it gives you like an insight, but we have to know people if we're going to, if we're going to preach. I had a, um, a very lovely person asked recently if they could preach and asked them two questions. I said, where are you preaching already? Because ultimately, if I just give you a microphone and there's 250 people sitting there, you're going to, like, flop pretty quickly. It's quite an intimidating thing here with all you lovely people looking at me. Um, and so I was like, where are you preaching already? And she's like, what do you mean? I was like, well, are you in a home group? Are you um, preaching there? Are you helping out at CU? Are you, are you finding other places and opportunities to preach? She's like, no, okay. And then I said, well, and who do you know in the church? And she's like, well, I don't know anyone. Um, and I was like, well, ultimately it would feel just like a guest preacher all the time unless you get to know people. And when you get to know people, the people get to know you and they know you as a communicator. And when, I think someone said it earlier, like people always have their favorites. You know, if you're in a church that has a lot of preachers, people always have their favorites. And I, I don't, I think that is true, but ultimately people's favorites are the people who know the most people because ultimately they're their friend up in the front. And so when you get 
uh, when you get churches where the pastor isn't that well known, it's going to change the, the um, effectiveness of their communication, ultimately. And so one more thing, and then we'll open the floor for Q&A before we end, if that's all right. Um, cool. I, as I said, we, like, we planned like a year in advance, which I'm not saying anyone needs to do that at all. Um, uh, but then what happens is I meet someone a month out, two weeks out, um, I ask for a bit more of a like skeleton, of, like, and it doesn't have to be full script at this point. Um, but then the Tuesday before the Sunday, we invite them in, whoever is speaking that Sunday, and they will come and give their sermon um, to me and like a, a, another member of the team, or it might be someone else as part of the church who lives locally or whatever, and they'll preach it on a Tuesday. I do this for a number of reasons, but it's changed my life. It's just, seriously, it's changed my life. One of the, one of the reasons is, is that so often I'd been in church circumstances, even that had a really high, great feedback culture, but so you had feedback coming back, but all, often it was after the event and after the moment of preaching, then you'd get feedback on this passage that you're not, probably not going to preach on again for another 12 years, and you're like, well, how helpful is that? And so what we do is we try and put all the content feedback before the Sunday, so they come and preach it on a Tuesday. We give them some feedback. They make some tweaks. They make some changes. And then by the time they're up on a Sunday, they've already preached a sermon once before. So they know that they've got people backing them already who have heard it and said it's cool and said, we're, as a team, we're going to back this and go forward with it. It means that they then spend from Tuesday to Sunday internalizing the message rather than making more content. Because we've all been there, haven't we? Friday or Saturday, we're like, oh, I'm preaching tomorrow. Um, and we've all done that. And you stay up late night, put matchsticks in your eyes, and you're like, I've got to get this sermon out. Because we put a hard deadline on a Tuesday, it means that actually the lead up to the preach is fairly chilled, like weirdly so. And it allows the Spirit of God to breathe. Because if you are just stressing Friday and Saturday about getting your content in, you live in no room for that. You live in no room. You're like, oh, I'm so glad I've got to the pulpit and now I'm just going to give this talk that I finally like, managed to uh, get out 8 o'clock this morning. And so we spend that time in that week doing any, like, if there's any sermon illustrations or any slides, make sure they're there and done. But what it means, preachers in the room, is I have Friday and Saturday off. I haven't written any Sunday content on a Saturday or a Friday for maybe like over two years. And it's because we have these hard deadlines on a Tuesday that mean that I, I'm not stressing. Now, what is beautiful is occasionally if I say to my wife, I feel like God said something, I need to like take half an hour just to go to a cafe and just add something. It's total, there's grace in the room for that. But it means that actually Friday and Saturday, I'm never thinking about talks. I'm preaching tomorrow. Don't need to think about it. What I will do though is, and this is a bit weird, I'm not saying you have to, but on a Thursday, um, I record just on a voice note, the talk on my own. I just record it. And then on a Sunday morning, I go to the gym before church, and that's what I'm listening to. While everyone else is listening to like Eric Prids or something, and I'm, I'm lifting weights while listening to my own voice preach the sermon I'm going to give, um, which is very weird. So if ever you see me in a gym, that's what I'm doing. Um, but, uh, but what it does is it helps me internalize the message, right? It helps it like get in there. And so even though I have notes, and I, I'm big fan of full script and you don't have to do that at all but I'm a big fan of that because it's there and so it means if I'm flapping I don't have to come up with anything on the spot and then it means that if I do step away from it occasionally Ruby um, then it means if I do step away from it then uh, I know that the spirit of God is doing something right again it's reformed me I promise because I used to be a post-it note preacher you know I used to have like three notes on a post-it note flap to my bible and that was it like, and I'll just go for like 45, 50 minutes, and that was it. Whereas now it's like, whoosh, it's all quite concise. 